right, we'll go ahead and get started. I uh, wanted to thank you all for coming to the Fundamentals of Wilderness. And I'm really glad you're all here today. Um, I wanted to start by uh, sharing that I'm speaking to you from the, um, oops, sorry about this, let me get to my notes here, uh, from the lands of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, the Cowlitz and the Clackamas people, and also acknowledging that others may have traveled and or stayed in this area, which is today called by many people Western Oregon. I'm really pleased to, um, I'm both your moderator and um, will be doing part of the presentation today. And I'm really pleased to be working with my colleagues, Dan Abbey and Ben Clark. Uh, ben is an intern that I've been working with, also with my uh, colleague, Becky Blanchard, who I see you're here today, Becky, thanks for joining us. Um, ben is an intern with the Virtual Student Federal Service Program through the State Department, and um, he's with our program in the Pacific Northwest Region Wilderness and Wild and Scenic Rivers and National Scenic Trails Program. Um, and we're with the Forest Service, and he's also a geography and history educator at the Crested Butte Community School. And so it's been a real pleasure to work with Ben. Um, and he, I want to give credit where credit is due that he is the brilliant creator of this uh, story map that we're going to share today um, as we're looking in this um, session to not only share with you uh, a lot of the concepts that are fundamental and foundational to the Wilderness Act and to how we steward and manage wilderness today, but also just some different and fresh ways to, to share that information. Um, and also working with my colleague, Dan Abbey, who's a wilderness specialist with the Arthur Carhart National Wilderness Training Center, um, which is based in Missoula. And um, Dan is, is actually based in New Hampshire at this time. So. Thank you very much for joining us today. And Ben is gonna get us started uh, with the presentation. Great, thank you, Nancy. And I really appreciate the kind words there. Our goal here is to help us understand, better understand uh, federally designated wilderness. Um, before we go any further, just kind of get a sense of where we're all at with wilderness um, and what we already may know or might not know for that matter. Just what words do you associate with wilderness? Um, but yeah, as you can see, some of the bigger words uh, or maybe the words that were more associated with uh, wilderness, at least in this group's eyes at this point is untrammeled, natural, solitude, free and wild, undeveloped. But then you can tell there's lots more that folks are thinking about here. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna kind of keep scrolling down here. So just to give us kind of like a general idea of where <clears throat> the lessons that we're gonna to try to cover today are five objectives here. The first one I'll be going over with you all um, in like a timeline uh, waterfall event here, but it's to understand the historical background behind the Wilderness Act. Objective two and three, Nancy will kind of take over and present on, first of all, the second objective is to understand the purpose of the Wilderness Act. And then the third objective, understand the central mandate of the Wilderness Act. So the fourth and fifth objectives, Dan will be taking over there. With the fourth objective, he'll be talking about prohibited uses in wilderness and what are some exemptions there as well. And then our fifth and final objective, we're gonna gain familiar, uh, familiarity, excuse me, with wilderness character. Let's we get to our first objective, which is understand the historical background behind the Wilderness Act. So for the sake of our, um, our timeline here, we're gonna start <clears throat> um, just kind of before the 1700s, 1700s is gonna be our first event. Um, and I will say it for the sake of time, that's kind of why we started here. But before uh, 1700s, the landscapes are inhabited by indigenous people during which wildlife was abundant. And at the same time, there was this misconception by Europeans arriving in the Americas that there were endless or limitless resources. And I will say at this point, kind of as we continue the, uh, the uh, waterfall timeline here, I use indigenous, Native American, and American Indians interchangeable. 
So I'll try to have two dates up there so that you can see um, the one we're talking about and then the one we just went over as well. Kind of continuing with the same time frame before the 1700s, <clears throat> Europeans saw indigenous lands as a new world with new opportunities. And with these new opportunities, they saw this as an opportunity to create new colonies. And this leads to hundreds of years of conflict that results in the displacement of indigenous peoples. And if you're not familiar with this, Native Land Digital here, let me scroll. There we go. You know, this map here, digital, uh, Native Land Digital, helps to demonstrate what the many different indigenous territories and languages looked like in the Americas before European arrival and European colonies, colonization. You can see this is a great resource. Um, you can click territories off, languages off, or languages on, excuse me, and kind of zoom in, get a better sense of that. So I welcome you to kind of check that out. But kind of continuing on then into the 18th century, the 1700s. Fur trappers and explorers are continually pushing the frontier boundary west. As Nancy mentioned, I'm a geography and history teacher, American history and world history for that matter. Um, and that's a common theme in American history is American settlers continually moving west. And as settlers and this expansion continues, it continually consumes the limited natural resources that are on the lands. And then one of the best examples of westward my movement in American history is this uh, Louisiana Purchase, which was purchased by President Jefferson in 1803, and it doubles the size of the country, purchased from the French, and you know, at the same time, while Americans are continually moving west, um, America and European art is focusing on romanticizing nature. And this is all happening, <clears throat> excuse me, this is all happening while native people speak of decreasing game and the limits on traditional travel ways. So continuing with this romantic movement, this really influences the appreciation of nature. However, during the same time, American settlers are um, continuing to displace native peoples. Uh, in addition, American settlers are rapidly expanding west, like I mentioned already. And this uh, continually leads to conflicts um, with different native peoples, resulting in uh, devastating land and territory loss for American Indians. And one of the um, kind of like focusing on this devastation and the effects on the land and the wildlife as westward expansion continues, one of the most notable destructive forces in during this time period um, is on the once immense herds of the American bison throughout the plains. So if you're looking at uh, the, the story map here, you can see this is a famous image uh, that represents this where um, <clears throat> we see two, um, two people, well, I guess one person standing on a pile of American bison skulls and one person standing next to it to kind of give it scale. Okay, so these destructive forces help lead to the creation of the U.S. Uh, Commission on Fish and Fisheries. And this is um, the origin of today's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, which is one of the not to get ahead of ourselves, but it's one of the four federal land management agencies that currently manages federally designated wilderness areas. Okay, kind of sticking with the same time frame leading up to the 1900s, um, recognizing the significant loss of wildlife and natural places, Americans start to create new protected areas and parks. And I just have a list of some of the most notable ones. So 1872, Yellowstone National Park is established. When it was established, many hoped that Yellowstone would kind of be the contrast to the wildly popular, but yet highly developed Niagara Falls. And really Yellowstone would provide this opportunity for more natural setting with the opportunity of solitude, which if I remember back to our word cloud initially, 
I saw solitude quite a few times and I saw natural a few times as well. All right, keep on moving to 1885. Adirondack Forest Reserve in New York is declared forever wild. Sequoia National Park is established in 1890. And then keeping kind of with this theme of <clears throat> uh, protecting new areas, in 1905, President Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, transferred the care of the forest reserves to the Department of Agriculture's new U.S. Forest Service. Um, and once again, uh, we already have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but now uh, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit again, the Forest Service will become one of the uh, other four federal land management agencies in charge of managing wilderness areas. And once again, keeping with the theme of protecting lands, the Antiquities Act in 1906 allows U.S. presidents to claim national monuments, which provide an extra level, uh, extra level excuse me, of protection for federal land. Um, without the approval of Congress. Now, this is important because once the Wilderness, Wilderness Act becomes law, federal wilderness lands will, um, can only be designated by Congress. So um, shortly thereafter, the Antiquities Act, we have the National, uh, National Park Service Organic Act, which is, establishes our National Park Service in 1916. And yep, it will be our third of four federal land management agencies in charge of mapping or uh, managing wilderness, excuse me. Okay, so the destruction of natural resources was becoming more and more evident to Americans and this notable, noticeable devastation led to considerable efforts to protect and preserve lands throughout the country. And I thought I'd show this data here from our world and data, um, and it is world for that matter. So it gives you a sense that the green is temperate rainforests <clears throat> and the uh, brownish color is uh, tropical forest. And this is just decade by decade from kind of the start of our uh, timeline here of forest loss uh, throughout the globe. And you can kind of see the time frame we're talking about here. We can see this massive increase of uh, forest loss here right around the 1920s. So what does that look like? I mean, you know, that looks like data right there, but you know, what does that look like um, in practice? Uh, these images come from the U.S. Forest Service's historical image collection, and you can kind of see some of the, the swipe image here, some of the <clears throat> results of this forest loss. All right, kind of continuing on, our fourth and final land management agency that oversees wilderness designated lands is the Bureau of Land Management, which is uh, uh, created in 1946 as a reorganization of two government agencies at the time period, the General Land Office and the U.S. Grazing Service. All right, so all of this is building up to 1956, where <clears throat> excuse me, Howard Zanizer, the executive director of the Wilderness Society at the time, drafted the idea of the Wilderness Act in 1956 with hopes to protect many of the nation's last remaining wilderness areas. You know, throughout the next eight years, there's 66 revisions to this, and uh, eventually Congress and wilderness leaders are debating and discussing it uh, about the possibility of wilderness becoming forever protected. Um, and then eventually the Wilderness Act became law on September 3rd, 1964, signed by President Lyndon B. Johnson, and it starts a legacy of preserving wild places for all Americans. So I'll keep scrolling here, and kind of coming back to some of the themes in early part of our timeline, um, I want to come back to Native Americans wilderness. You know, as noted above throughout the years in this timeline, Native Americans were removed from their ancestral lands, some of which were eventually designated wilderness. And Native Americans have a deep history and connection to these lands, and many criticized the Wilderness Act's European-centric viewpoint. However, though more recently, <clears throat> Some groups have started to advocate support wilderness designation, and here are just a few examples. In 1980, Alaska Natives uh, have input into the Alaska National Interest Land Conservation Act, ANILCA, um, which ensures there's continued subsistence use and the largest increase in wilderness designation in US history. 
1982, the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes create, uh, create the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness. 1986, there's an establishment of the Inter, uh, Intertribal Sinkion Wilderness Council. And uh, even more recently here in 2020, the Crow tribe formally requests the wilderness protection of their sacred lands in the crazy mountains of Montana. And then in 2021, the Navajo Nation supports the America's Red Rock Wilderness Act. And yeah, that just gets us to the present here where public awareness, activism, and conservation efforts continue to uh, lead to more attention on environmental protection and landmark legislation. And to kind of just come back to where <clears throat> that data that we looked at loss of forest, uh, forest throughout the decades, um, this is some data from 2018 that just shows like the shared percentage of protected lands throughout the world uh, at a country scale. So you can see the United States is just a shade under 13%, and that's in 2018. So that data could have changed at this point. Okay, and that kind of takes us through uh, events leading up to the Wilderness Act, uh, and then there after the Wilderness Act as well. So we wanted to show just this short video, what is wilderness, to kind of keep that idea of thinking about what does wilderness mean to you all. Um, it's about four minutes long, so I'm going to share my audio here. In 1964, when the Wilderness Act became law, Congress stated that we preserve and protect designated wilderness in their natural condition. What I love about wilderness is the fact that it's wild. Um, I mean, it's, it's in its name, wild wilderness. Wilderness is a federal designation of a piece of land that is within a national forest, a national park, National Wildlife Refuge or part of the Bureau of Land Management system. It's a place where we can go and not see the impacts of humans for the most part and see how um, the landscape of our country is supposed to be. I mean, I can't believe that we have all of this. I didn't even know this existed. I literally had no idea this existed. Wilderness is important to me because I get to hear the hush of the land while I'm out here. Um, I don't hear planes, trains, or automobiles. I don't hear people screaming. I don't got to deal with babies or dogs or anything. It's wildlife. It's nature. It's the wind and the birds and the insects and the few people that you're out here with. When I'm in the wilderness, what I like most about myself is my ability to be present with where I'm at and to really observe and notice what's going on around me and use all my senses and feel what's happening and my place in the landscape. The way I get inspired for being out in the wilderness is it just helps me concentrate more because I don't concentrate very easily and it just helps me like more like think about the things I want to do like if I had more time to do it, like what I could do. One of the most important things about wilderness for me is the solitude and just being out here and being completely alone, but never lonely, that there's so much beauty and wild and life out here that 
I'm never lonely. Wilderness means different things to different people. What does it mean to you? Wilderness is a place where we can go and see nature as it should be, where it's acting on its, on its own terms. All right, great. And from what we did uh, to start this presentation, I already get a sense of what we think uh, wilderness means to us at this point. Um, I'm gonna scroll down to objective two and pass it off to Nancy. Thanks, Ben. So in objective two, we're gonna really dive more into what the purpose of the Wilderness Act is. We can, we've, we've talked about in that, that great waterfall timeline that Ben presented of what, what led up to the kind of what inspired the Wilderness Act. And in the, the, the first, um, I call them lily pads here, <laughs> in the purpose, this very first one, um, we think about the, the title, um, an act to establish a national wilderness preservation system for the permanent good of the whole people and for other purposes. So it's meant for people, but there's much more to it than that. It, um, and, and we'll get more into detail about that here in just a second. So in the second lily pad, we talk a little bit about section 2A of the act, and, and we really encourage you with all of these to to go to the act and go to some of these other resources and, and look more deeply into this. Um, so we talked about in, when Ben was speaking about how the, the country was becoming more developed, the population was expanding. We know that um, the industrial revolution happened during, was, was really going quickly during certain decades. Um, and so, so places got more urban, more industrialized, more developed. And there was a big worry that all lands would would be un, would fall under this pattern. Um, so the intent, part of the intent behind the Wilderness Act was that it was more than just a wilderness ecosystem and that it's a resource of wilderness. And it encompasses more than just physical resources, um, such as air, water, and wildlife, but it's also the less tangible parts of that. So the place to seek opportunities for personal risk challenge, uh, primitive conditions, solitude, adventure, and freedom. And, and like the video touched on that a little bit about what people feel when they're in wilderness and, and what they experience. And that's a really, really important part of that. So in section 2A in the, in the act, it really gets into that. So the next two are getting into section 2C. And we're going to talk more about this um, but here we start talking about wilderness character. And so I'm just going to kind of list what they are for now. And then again, we'll talk more in depth about it in this presentation. And then there's a whole um, hour plus that is going to um, talk even more in depth about wilderness character, but untrammeled. Uh, undeveloped natural opportunities for solitude and a primitive or unconfined type of an unconfined type of recreation are four of the qualities. And then the fifth quality in the next lily pad is other features of value. And so um, in these can be ecological, geological, or other features of scientific, educational, scenic, or historical value. And again, we'll get more into detail about what those mean, but this will get you thinking about what the, um, the purpose of the act is and what is being protected um, in, when something is done and when lands are designated as wilderness. So in the next one, we get into section 4B of the Wilderness Act, and it talks there we go. And it talks about the public purposes, which are recreation, scenic, scientific, educational, conservation, and historic use. And so these public purposes are, are at the heart of, of what kind of the, the human side of this, of, of what people might seek out in these places and what uh, these areas might be used for. And instead of 
being developed into urban places or places or where resources are extracted. There's there's these other some more tangible than others, um, and, and really for the value of the lands themselves and the inherent uh, values that that exist there. And then the other piece of Section 4B that's really important is that the agencies are mandated to protect and preserve wilderness character. So just to kind of wrap up this, this objective and talk about what the purpose of the Wilderness Act is, that there's the purpose of the act and then there's the public purposes of wilderness. So the purpose of the act, it was unique legislation that recognizes these lands for their intrinsic values. And it was protection of these lands from expanding human populations and development that were having significant impacts on lands across the continent. And then the public purposes of wilderness called out those specific purposes and how human populations in modern times interact with wilderness in this era post-European settlement. And to add to that, uh, today the, the wilderness community is more often and very importantly recognizing that these lands were shaped by the presence and stewardship of people who lived and traveled on these lands for generation, generations long before 1964. So just in closing for this objective, I noted here that a passage of the Wilderness Act was a unique law, and it was the first time that lands were set aside and protected from threats such as resource extraction and development in this era of European settlement for their own inherent value. And the highest values of the lands were meant to be protected as they exist in that natural setting. So not for the economic value of what could be extracted from them, but rather for the value of what exists there. So moving on to objective, oh, we have a video here that we'll show. In the United States, we are looking to the future when we designate and protect wilderness. As Congress stated, it's set aside for the American people of present and future generations. You know, the reason why wilderness areas were protected was to be able to set aside these um, wild, primitive uh, tracts of land in our country. And really, that is what we have to showcase here in America that is unique and awesome. I feel like those of us today um, who are wilderness managers and that next generation of millennials that is up and coming, it is going to be a really important job for us to continue that wilderness preservation into the future. Any of these kids that come out here, especially if it's their first time, they're going to have some experiences and see some things that they've never seen before. And those will become memories that'll last, stay with them for their lifetime. And they'll appreciate it. And, and they will fall in love with this country. They'll wanna protect it. Um, they'll wanna continue to save it and save places like this. And so we, we have to introduce this to each generation along the way. We got to ride close up to Red Mountain and it was awesome to stand in the same spot where my grandpa probably stood before. It just sort of reminds me of like, like my culture, like my ancestors, like, like the way they grew up, like their surroundings and what they had to do to survive. I don't know, it's just, it's just what I think of when I think of wilderness. Most young people are not landowners. 
but our public lands, including federally designated wilderness, belong to every U.S. citizen, and that includes young citizens. Wilderness protection today is even more important than it's ever been um, because there's even more push and demand from civilization today than there was in 1964. So yeah, we'll move on to objective three now and understanding the central mandate of the Wilderness Act. Um, and here, we're really gonna get into, um, in section 2C, and really dive deeper into those five qualities of wilderness character that we touched on a few minutes ago. And you will probably gather from, from this, uh, this section, this objective, and then we do another one um, here in objective five, talking about wilderness character, you can really see how that, that concept of wilderness character is really at the heart of the Wilderness Act. And, how we um, think about stewardship of wilderness um, from all different perspectives, the public and agencies and partners and, and everyone and people visiting wilderness, we hope to share that, these ideas as well. So it, again, that central mandate comes from section 2C and these qualities and their preservation are at the heart of the act. To the next one. So we'll start with untrammeled. So a wilderness in contrast with those areas where humans and their works dominate the landscape are hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by humans, where humans themselves are visitors who do, do not remain. So this um, idea of untrammeled is approaching stewardship of wilderness with humility and, and restraint. And you can go to the next one then. Um, it's, it's essentially unhindered and free from intentional action, actions of modern human control and manipulation. And that, that word intentional is really, um, really key to the idea of untrammeled um, because that intentional manipulation would be, would be a trammeling. And again, we'll get more into the nuances of that in some of the following sections in the the presentation on, on Thursday. So the next quality of wilderness character is undeveloped. So an area of undeveloped federal land retaining its primeval character and influence without permanent improvements or human habitation. So in when we talk about undeveloped, we are thinking about the imprint of human work is substantially, excuse me, can't talk here, get my tongue untangled substantially unnoticeable without permanent improvements or the sights and sounds of modern human occupation. We can go to the next one, Ben. So it's without structures and the use of motors or mechanical transport that increase the human ability to occupy or modify the environment. And then the next one is natural. So preserve its natural conditions. It generally appears to have been affected primarily by the forces of nature with the imprint of human works is substantially unnoticeable. So when we, when we think about the natural setting, it's substantially free from the effects of modern civilization, and it encompasses the, all the naturally occurring biological and physical elements of wilderness. So plant and animal species and communities, soil, air, water, the interactions among those elements and then the resulting ecological processes that occur in wilderness. Go to the next one. So again, yeah, really thinking about how it's free of the influences of modern civilization. And then the next one, outstanding opportunities for solitude or a primitive and unconfined type of recreation. And this really starts to get us thinking about those, those less tangible uh, parts of wilderness and people's experiences and the setting that, that, that offers that experience um, and whether humans are there or not. I mean, it really highlights the vital role, roles of solitude, self-reliance, and freedom as central to the idea of wilderness and the benefits and inspiration derived from physical and mental challenge. And I'm sure 
many of you have experienced it and seek it out when you go to wilderness um, to these places that uh, humans are very small and insignificant on the landscape. And then the next one is other features value. And this is, this gets to uh, parts of a wilderness that are really unique and essential to the character of that place. Um, so it's ecological, geological, or other features of scientific, educational, scenic, or historical value. And so some examples of this are if a place has really special geology that's, that's just really unique, um, that is found maybe other places, but, but very rarely um, unique in the way it looks, in the way it acts, in the landscape. Um, and another example could be um, paleontological uh, resources, such as, you know, you have sites where um, evidence of dinosaurs um, in past um, eras have, have been found and um, that are very unique to that, to that landscape. Um, and so they, these, when these types of resources um, or um, uh, features on the landscape are found in a wilderness and they rise to that unique level and that they're really essential to what that wilderness um, is and what it means, um, then we may think about calling out a, a special other feature of value in a wilderness area. And not all wilderness areas have something like that. So it's, um, as the fifth quality of wilderness character, you may not see that in all wilderness areas, or you don't see that on, in all wilderness areas, but it's a really important um, feature of, of, of certain places. So just to wrap up this, um, this, this third objective. So we talked about there's five qualities of wilderness character and the central mandate for the four federal, federal agencies that manage and steward wilderness um, is the responsibility to preserve these five qualities. And the five qualities all together uh, provide that or create that unique setting that provides what the Wilderness Act describes as the benefits of an enduring resource of wilderness. And all five qualities are equally important. And sometimes you may or may not see um, other features of value called out in a specific wilderness. And just in closing, um, one of the sentences I really like from the publication, Keeping It Wild Too, which Ben um, will bring up, uh, Dan's gonna present in the fifth um, objective is, is a publication that has some really beautiful language in it of describing wilderness character. And wilderness character is the capacity of an area to elicit humility, to awaken a sense of relationship and interconnectedness with the community of life, and to evoke a feeling of restraint and obligation towards nature. So with that, we'll have a video and then I'll turn it over to Dan to do the next two objectives. Thanks. Some go to wilderness to hunt or fish, some for exercise, some to find themselves and others to lose themselves. Those who study the history of humans know that this has always been our way. I had a guide once who, um, in high school, and he said, you know, honestly, it doesn't really matter to me who's on my group, who's in my group, who's on my trip. I just do the logistics, I get you guys out here, and then I let the wilderness do what it does to people. <laughs> I think that's probably the most valuable mm -hmm. part of the experience is, is really just making the experience happen for people. 
doing what we can to let it happen for other people. So one of the really cool things about wilderness, I think, is all of the experiences that we can have out there, um, just a variety of experiences. You know, there's a typical things you think about recreation wise, like going out hiking on a trail and picking huckleberries or going fishing in a mountain lake. Um, but there's all those things that you don't think about um, that make wilderness really special. Things like laying out under the stars in your sleeping bag at night and looking up at the sky and seeing stars like you've never seen them before, just so bright and so spectacular. Just in the wild, whether it's the national forest or in a wilderness area, they're all unique and special. And I feel like I learned so much, um, not just about my surroundings, but also myself. And so I think it's really important for everyone to kind of go through that kind of journey. Wilderness gives us the opportunity to feel like we may be the only ones who have ever been there. We're the only ones that have ever stood on the top of that mountain. We're the only ones that have ever swam in that alpine lake. We're the only ones that have seen that exact view. And it's such a special feeling to have that. Not everything that we do here is, is gonna be, you know, smiles. It's not gonna be happy. Sometimes you have to hike harder than, farther and harder than you want to. Sometimes your pack is way too heavy, um, but basically, that's sort of what makes things, that was what makes you so excited about certain little things, like having, say, macaroni for dinner. Like, that just makes you so joyful about that because your day wasn't, you know, perfect, you know, and that's part of it. And that's also what helps you live so simply, is because by, through that kind of um, determination and kind of facing that pain, you cut all the haze out and you, and you learn to sort of um, feel tired and be hungry and, and deserve what you have. I think that kids that spend a little bit of time in the wilderness go away with an increase in self-confidence and self-esteem. You know, when you can go out into the wild and you can be out there for two or three or four days or a week or two weeks, if you backpack or ride horses or however you do it, you go away thinking, you know, there's a, there's a lot that I didn't know I had the capability of doing. If I can do that, well, then I can probably do a lot of other things I didn't know that I could do. And so, I mean, I just think that, that one of the great things about wilderness is that it, that it does build, build uh, kids' uh, self-confidence. And of course, that then manifests itself into all sorts of advantages that they'll have now and in the future. Designated wilderness represents only a small percentage of the U.S. land mass, yet it is only within wilderness that some experiences can reach their ultimate expression. So preserving wilderness character by law is the central mandate of the Wilderness Act, but all of these words that you're using are at the heart of, of wilderness and we all think about it in different ways. And so all, all the answers are right. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone. And I, sorry, now we'll turn it over to Dan. <laughs> I don't know why I forgot about the video and the next word cloud. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Super, thanks, Nancy, and thanks, Ben. Um, so I'll, I'll go over the prohibited uses, but just to get you guys, um, Thinking a little bit, there's actually 10 prohibited uses that are outlined in the Wilderness Act in Section 4C. Commercial enterprises are prohibited in wilderness. So hopefully, you know, as you guys move through your careers, if you're ever challenged with, let's say, a, a commercial filming crew comes and says, hey, we want to do something in wilderness, hopefully there'll be a little voice on your shoulder saying, wait a minute, I think that's a prohibited use. So that is one of the prohibited uses, a commercial enterprise. We're gonna run through the other 10. I see, see in chat, people got some, got some good ones. Yes, no motorized anything. Motorized equipment, leave it as you found it. No mechanical things, good. No buildings, leave modern behind, good. So um, another prohibited Prohibition in, in wilderness is any permanent road. So there should be no permanent road in wilderness. 
no paved road, no permanent gravel road. Another, <clears throat> the, we'll say number three is a temporary road. So there's, there is a prohibition against temporary roads as well. Use of motor vehicles. So no motor vehicles are allowed in wilderness. If you see one, you should really be surprised. Motorized equipment, and I want you to pay attention to this chainsaw's name, if you can see it on there, but no motorized equipment. So this would also include chainsaws, motorized blowers, like a leaf blower, um, a motorized winch, so no motorized equipment. No motorboats, and again, in Section 4C of the Wilderness Act, it outlines all of these. Keep going, Ben, thanks. Landing of aircraft. So this is a good one because landing of aircraft is prohibited according to the Wilderness Act, the 1964 Wilderness Act. Um, and that includes some, delivering something by air. So if, if you're flying over wilderness and you throw a box of food to a friend that's camping, yeah, that's not allowed. So no landing aircraft and structures. Now you guys probably have a question about structures because I'm sure if you spent time in wilderness, you probably noticed some structures in wilderness, but we're gonna talk about that in a second. And mechanical transport. So this is a good one. So no bicycles in wilderness, um, no motorized game carts in wilderness, or for that matter, no game carts in wilderness. So no motorized or mechanized mechanical transport. And installation. So installations is called out. So that's over and above structures. So installations like this one here technically would be prohibited in wilderness. So those are the 10. And again, I would refer you to section 4C of the Wilderness Act, which actually is titled Prohibition of Certain Uses. That's what it says in the Wilderness Act itself. Okay, Ben, so of the 10 prohibited uses, there are two that are a hard prohibition. In other words, you can't get around them. They're strictly prohibited, end of story, end of sentence. You should never see a commercial enterprise in wilderness and you should never see a permanent road in wilderness. And I do have to make a couple of couple of distinctions here. There are commercial services provided in wilderness, but there shouldn't be a commercial enterprise. So of the other 10, the eight that are prohibitions, the Wilderness Act did allow agencies some flexibility and basically said that except as necessary to meet the minimum requirements for the administration of the area, you could actually allow those, those prohibitions. So I'll use structures as one example. Many agencies have patrol cabins or backcountry cabins or wilderness cabins that have been determined the minimum necessary for the administration of the area. In other words, to administer the area, it's important to have personnel out there and to have personnel out there, we need to have the support of a structure to house them or, or support them. So the other thing I, I want to bring up too, because we're starting, <clears throat> because it's important for you to know. So the Wilderness Act is the benchmark. The Wilderness Act sort of lays the groundwork for subsequent wilderness legislation. And according to the Wilderness Act, as you've just seen, there are 10 prohibitions, prohibited uses, of which two are hard prohibitions, and the rest, you can have some flexibility from an administrative standpoint. But Congress also realized that they could put special provisions in wilderness legislation. And those special provisions could allow what would be considered a non-conforming use, i.e. a prohibited use, in wilderness for that specific piece of land or specific area of wilderness. 
So one, I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to read the Wilderness Act, the 1964 Wilderness Act. It shouldn't take you that long. It's a short, actually, in some ways, poetic piece of legislation. But then you should also read the legislation that created your wilderness area, the wilderness area that you work for. And you should specifically look for the wording and the verbiage that may allow a use that would otherwise be prohibited. So gain a familiarity with the five qualities of wilderness characters. So this should be a little bit of a review for you guys because Nancy mentioned these, but I'm going to let Ben go ahead and play this video. The five qualities of wilderness character. Before we discuss wilderness character, it is important to understand today's wilderness exists on the homelands of indigenous peoples. They shaped these lands throughout the continent before European arrival. These five qualities of wilderness character are identified and defined in the 2015 Keeping It Wild 2 guide for land managers. To begin, the first quality identified is untrammeled. This means wilderness ecological systems are unhindered and free from intentional actions of modern human control or manipulation. In short, wilderness should be free of or not hampered by human dominance. The second quality is natural, as in, Wilderness ecological systems are substantially free from the effects of modern civilization. This lasting natural setting is preserved through wilderness for future generations to enjoy, just as we do today and others have in the past. The third quality of wilderness character, undeveloped. This means wilderness is essentially without structures or installations, the use of motors or mechanical transports. Similar to the first two qualities, Undeveloped is the tangible quality that we can see and appreciate today, so in the future we can still see and appreciate the undeveloped, natural, and untrammeled wilderness setting. The fourth quality is outstanding opportunities for solitude or primitive and unconfined recreation. Wilderness provides outstanding opportunities for solitude or primitive and unconfined recreation. As society becomes more and more technologically focused, Wilderness will continue to provide us a nature-based setting to continue to enjoy and challenge ourselves for generations to come. The fifth and final quality of wilderness character provides for other features of value. Wilderness may have unique features of ecological, geological, scientific, educational, scenic, or historical value that are equally important to preserve and protect for society to enjoy and learn and benefit from in the future. These are the five qualities of wilderness character. Managed with humility and restraint, wilderness areas are intended to be self-willed lands where natural processes operate freely. The Wilderness Act mandates protection of wilderness character. Wilderness is meant to retain its primeval character and influence, to be affected primarily by the forces of nature, with the imprint of human work substantially unnoticed. All five qualities of wilderness character are equally important. They create a holistic approach to preserving the wilderness resource. As stewards of the wilderness, the decisions and actions we make can help preserve or degrade the wilderness character. For more information and guidance on wilderness character and wilderness management, please refer to Keeping It Wild 2, which is the interagency strategy to monitor trends in wilderness character across the National Wilderness Preservation System. Keep keep going here. Um, here, I'll put this in the chat as well. It's a review. Um, if you've been in high school in the past 10 or so years, you've probably seen Quizlets by your teacher. Um, so I have a little Quizlet that I created just for wilderness. Uh, some of the stuff we went over today, but honestly, not all of it we went over today. Some of it are just kind of fun facts of wilderness. So I put it in the chat there for the sake of time. Uh, I don't think we'll go over it, um, but if you're familiar with Quizlet, there's all sorts of fun quiz modes there. There's match, learn, test, or if you just want to flashcard your uh, knowledge, you can move, you can cycle through them there. Uh, once again, I put that in the chat as well. Um, so kind of scrolling down, <clears throat> um, here are some further resources um, to maybe help you develop your wilderness expertise. Um, I will say, um, and some links to federal land management agencies as well. Um, I will say if you're specifically looking at some of these and you want it, maybe we can put the links in the chat here at the end. Um, but then also I 
I do want to kind of scroll down a little quick here as time's winding down um, and just make sure you have Nancy and Dan's contacts um, because if something comes up later down the road and you're like, oh, wait, I want to know more about that or this or what have you, um, please feel free to contact Nancy and or Dan here. Um, and I'll leave that. Uh, should I? Should I put that in the chat actually kind of as we wind down here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking too, this is being recorded. So folks are, once those recordings are posted, um, we'll be able to go back and um, get, you know, can go ahead to this part if you want to grab some of these resources um, from the screen. Um, so. Awesome. And I did put Nancy and Dan's emails in the chat as well. Um, yeah, and then just the last thing I have, there are resources and tools I, uh, I use to create this story map lesson. Uh, story map is an Esri product. Obviously we use menti.com quite a few times. Um, the presentation for objective two was a Prezi that I created for Nancy's uh, presentation, the Quizlet there at the end. And I got some of that data from our world and data. And then finally that video you watched for Dan's objective five was created through a Move, uh, Movavi uh, video creator. Um, but that's all I have, Nancy, if you want to take over. Yeah, sure thing. Well, thanks. And folks, we had so much fun presenting all of this. We are right at the end of our time. So sorry, um, we didn't have time for questions and answers, but you have Dan's and my contact information um, and email for me is the best way um, to reach me. And um, just really wanted to thank Ben very much for this uh, creation of this story map um, and, and just hope that it inspires you all uh, for some new ways to present information when you're asked to give a presentation on your, your home unit or to your um, organization that you, uh, that you work with or um, a school or, or any number of um, forums. And so with that, and I also want to thank Dan so much, um, his expertise um, at, at giving presentations like this and sharing wilderness knowledge was also really helpful. So these two educators here were, um, for me, it was, I learned a lot in, in this and, and how to present this information. So with that, I want to thank you all.